first letter to the Corinthians. It be the God and Father of our chapter 1 and verse 3. Fight the good fight, Timothy chapter 6. We're looking at a short but ever lengthening series on extraordinary psalms and we come to this 142nd and the subject is David in desperate circumstances and his reaction and his great prayer and what an example and a help it is to us. The king looks back as he pens this psalm to the time before he was king. He is in either the cave Adullam or the cave in Gedi, uh, possible to know which, but the superscription tells us that that's his situation and it causes him to look back and to pen this psalm. Some translations put it all in the present tense, but... uh, Our translators in the King James Version have very wisely varied the tense to suit the context, and uh, I shall explain that as we proceed. But this first verse, David is articulating a very great need. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. Now even allowing for the necessities of structure of Hebrew poetry, there is no doubt that David means to emphasize that he put into words clearly all his concerns, that he articulated them. He looks back and he is evidently inspired to write this psalm and to sing this psalm in order to be a lesson in prayer to the people of God in distress. And the first and the most basic point in the psalm is that needs before God must be articulated, intelligently, plainly, formulated in words, whether uttered or whether thought is not relevant, but plain, meaningful words. It isn't enough in prayer to just uh, telescope things into a rough or an approximate request. We're to make our petitions and our supplications clear and plain and mean them. And that's emphasized at the very beginning here. We have not because we ask not, says the Apostle James. I cried unto the Lord. These are earnest cries. With my voice, he spoke them, certainly in his heart, if not out loud, and he made his supplication. The word translated supplication, meaning that uh, he bent low before the Lord, but it's figurative, obviously, and it means that he prays in a very humble mode, in a dependent mode. He knows that All answer to prayer is by the grace and mercy of God alone. Nothing is deserved. Nothing can be demanded. But we pray in the light of the promises of God to us. Nevertheless, we pray as to one who is gracious and vastly above us and senior to us. And that's the sense of the word there translated supplication. So it begins with David articulating his needs. And uh, we have to add to that because his situation is terrible. Whether it's in the cave of Dullam or uh, in Gedi, his situation is dangerous and and it is impossible for him to see any way out. Now, in great danger or difficulty or a situation where you cannot see a way out, the weakness of the human heart is such that the most unworthy reactions to these difficulties can come about. And you find you are perhaps filled with self-pity, you complain about the unreasonableness of your situation you find somebody to blame if you can Uh, I'm not accusing anybody of this I'm just saying what the 
weakness of human nature is. Maybe to get very angry and to vilify somebody and to blame them. I wouldn't be in this situation if it were not for this one or for that one. And just to uh, fume and, uh, wow, if it was in, uh, in Gedi, when David had the opportunity to take Saul's life, you would have thought that the, uh, well, the tense situation and the unreasonableness of Saul and his murderous ways going after him, you'd think he would lash out and he would be only too pleased to listen to what his loyal uh, supporters were saying to him. Kill him, take his life. This is the opportunity of the Lord that has been given to you. You'd think that in great anger he would do that. But David restrains himself and stills himself. He controls himself. It's a great challenge here. Do we have unworthy, testy, angry reactions in circumstances where we can see no way out, where there's a tremendous problem confronts us? Well, David's example here, it isn't always like this, but most of the time it is, his example to us here is to take himself in hand and to hold back from all that. And he articulates his concerns to God. He doesn't rant at his helpers, his supporters who are with him, his armed men. He addresses himself to God. He's looking back at it. The record in 1 Samuel 24 doesn't tell us this, but he cast himself on God in prayer, as he endeavoured to do always. So the first verse is not simply of a report of what he did, how he articulated prayer, we remember the circumstances he was in, and that's he made this plaintive cry. I cried unto the Lord with my voice in clear words did I make my supplication. And verse 2 adds to this the articulation of the need, I poured out, and the word poured is just what the original says I spilled or poured out my complaint before him he rehearsed his difficulty he didn't actually make a complaint perhaps the word complaint may give you the wrong impression it isn't a complaint he rehearses before God shows him fully his difficulty if you write a letter as from time to time we may have to do to some very important person or some dignitary, you, you, you compose your letter and then you check it, you look over it, you change a word here and a word there, you retype it, you may do it again, anything important, you mind your P's and Q's, you say this is too long, somebody in that dizzy height is not going to read this letter unless I can find a more succinct way of expressing everything. And you dabble with it and shorten it and make it just perfect and to the point and yet reasonable and polite you put so much into it but you don't have to do that with the Lord you come of course with great respect and care but you can just pour out your complaint because in all his fatherly kindness he'll hear his people there's nothing to hold us back from taking our concerns to the Lord and this is a tremendous expression I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. So the problem has to be articulated. It may be that you hesitate to do that because it's a problem you've got yourself into and you've caused it. Maybe you've got into a situation or let's say we, we can all do this I don't want to be holier than thou, and we do all do this, but maybe we've been a little greedy. So we've run ourselves into trouble and acquired something that now presents a difficulty to us, or we've taken a step we shouldn't have taken without prayer and consideration or advice, and it turned out to be a foolish step. So the problem we're in is, to a large extent, perhaps, of our own making, and that holds us up. We, we cannot easily take it to God in prayer. It's my own foolish fault. But no, you can. 
You can still confess your sin, acknowledge it before the Lord, lay the whole problem before him in clear words. I showed before him my troubles, his needs, his fears, his anxieties. He stated them very clearly. And verse 3 here, look at this. He affirms now great consolation. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, that means clothed, covered, and our King James translators have rendered it overwhelmed, and I'm sure that's right to do that, but the Hebrew perhaps is um, a little more descriptive. When my spirit was clogged up almost, clothed and clouded, There were options I could have taken. I could try this. I could try that to solve my problem. No, this won't work. That's no good. I'm blocked off from doing this. This is what David is saying. I've really thought through this so that my thinking system, my mind, is just smothered over and clogged up and clouded out is the sense of the original with all my worries and my strugglings to find a solution, and I can't. My spirit, when my spirit was overwhelmed in that rather complex sense, then thou knewest my path. David looks back at this experience, and it taught him something which he remembered in all his praying. So first you articulate the need, and then secondly, even as you call upon the Lord, If you follow David, you console yourself with the thought that the Lord knows exactly what your situation is and exactly what he's going to do about it, exactly how he plans to bring you through it and out of it. He is only waiting for you to articulate the prayer. He is only waiting for you to lay it before him so that he can act for you. And David says here, when my spirit was overwhelmed, he knew all along exactly what he was going to do. Then thou knewest my path. And that's a tremendous principle in prayer. Articulate your concerns properly and sensibly before the Lord. Don't let off steam at anybody on earth. Don't fulminate in fury with some fellow human being. Just lay it all before the Lord. Console yourself that you're a child of God and he knows exactly what he's going to do. Now David had a great consolation. He knew that his life would not be ended by Saul because by God's direction Samuel had anointed him to be king. He wasn't king yet. But this was inevitable. This anointing had the status of prophecy. It was going to come to pass. It was a promise of God, an anointing by God. And so with us, we can say, well, God has promised his people to hear their repentance, to bless them and guide them. Does that mean there will never be any consequences for my mistakes and my foolishnesses? Well, yes, there may be some consequences to teach us never to do it again when the Lord delivers us out of the problem, if we've made it for ourselves. He may leave some small penalty in place as a reminder to us not to make the same mistake again. But he knows what he's going to do to deliver us. So verse 3 is really the affirming of consolation. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. And then he returns to the complaint in a way. And here it is in the second part of verse 3. In the way wherein I walked, have they privily, secretly laid a snare for me. That's the problem, that he's going to be trapped every way he turns. Well, when he was fleeing from the murderous fury of Saul, it was like that. Saul 
was very cunning and would stop at nothing. And Saul would greatly reward anyone who betrayed David and said so more than once and did so reward people and anybody who informed on the whereabouts of David and he couldn't slip around too secretly because he had his armed men and his helpers with him. But anybody who informed would be rewarded with lands and estates even. And then anybody who failed to inform, you remember how Saul commanded that 85 of the priests should be murdered and an entire priest's town, the wives, the children, would all be murdered also at the command of Saul because in his fevered mind they hadn't informed on David's whereabouts. And so uh, in the way wherein I walked have they secretly laid a snare for me and I stretched that to cover all the cunning that Saul employed to get information intelligence about David's whereabouts. And few people in those circumstances could help him. Verse 4 isn't self-pity. I looked, it's, it's realism. I looked on my right hand and behold, beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. A way of escape is the original. Couldn't be found. Refuge failed me. No man cared or looked for my soul. Now, I don't think what David means is as bad as it sounds. I'm sure he he appreciated that there were people who felt for him and people who supported him, like the king's son, Jonathan, and others also, and those who were with him physically, and many others, it transpires, later in the record, beside them. He's not imagining necessarily that nobody is for him, But nobody is acting for him. There's no opportunity for them to do so. The people who are with David and the spiritual, the children of God who appreciate him, they they can't emerge with the murder of so many priests and all the difficulties. Well, they just had no way of helping him. So what he says is perfectly true. There's nobody in a position, there's nobody acting to assist him. And it often seems like that in life, in the spiritual battle, in the world, that you're on your own and people don't understand your situation. I looked on my right hand and beheld, no, this is not a problem that I'm in, says David, that any human being can solve. I can't solve it myself. There is nobody in the world positioned to come to my aid and to assist me. Saul has total control in this situation. I have thought and thought, and there is no way out. I'm going to be hounded and hounded. Only the Lord can see me through. It's not completely helpless. All is not lost. But now look at verse 5, and here's another heading for you. David affirms another consolation. And this consolation, we must affirm this too in our praying. This consolation, uh, well, I was going to call it the parallel life, but you can't really say that these days because uh, that means something quite different. Uh, uh, Think of the uh, old-time Greek author Plutarch and his parallel lives, and uh, various people have attempted this theme ever since in the world of fiction, tracing the similarities between lives and building all sorts of mysterious uh, conclusions on that. So you can't use the word parallel lives, but we have, in a sense, a parallel life, another life. Our life in this world is not the only life we have. We have a parallel or another life, and you well know what it is. We are children of the Lord. We're en route to eternity we're being used to serve him to that end and trained and changed and developed to that end and so David looks at that in this fifth verse I cried unto thee O Lord I said and listen to this thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living 
These are tremendous words. We could spend all evening with just these words. David consoled himself with the fact that he could call upon God that he had a more important level of life than simply that which can be seen in this world. He's a child of God and he has to be viewed at two levels. As a king, well, he wasn't yet, but he was by the time I wrote, he wrote this psalm, I'm sure. As a ruler with responsibilities and policies to devise and things to oversee, but he's got another life, a much more important life, his walk with God, and that's what counts. That's much more important. And viewed from the standpoint of this other life, his spiritual life and pilgrimage, God will see him through every situation and everything will be a blessing to his soul and everything will work to his eternal security. So he says, and he consoles himself. It's a good idea to do this in prayer, to follow his example. Lay your needs before the Lord. Remind yourself that the Lord knows exactly what he's going to do in answer to your prayer as a perfect solution. What more perfect solution could there have been to David's predicament when pursued by Saul, if we're right in thinking that it was in the strongholds and caves of Engedi? Why? That God should overrule in such a way that his enemy should come into that very elaborate cave to sleep at his feet. Astonishing. God does the most amazing things in answer to prayer. And he knew all along that he was going to work in this way. David's great dilemma was this, that he could not attack Saul. He was bound not to attack the king of Judah and Israel. He couldn't do that. That was unthinkable. And that was against God's clear commands. So what could he do? He couldn't escape him. He couldn't retaliate against him. There was no way out. There was nobody in a position to help him. What could he do? And God brings him into the stronghold and lays him at his feet. What an encouragement for the people of God down the centuries of time. The astonishing and unthought of ways in which God can overrule in our problems and our difficulties. So even in prayer we express faith. I cried unto thee, O Lord, verse 5. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion, my inheritance. I think of heavenly things in the land of the living. In the land of the living? What does David mean by the land of the living? Now, if you've gone to the lengths of buying an expensive study Bible, a modern study Bible. I'm pretty sure, I haven't looked at them all, I'm pretty sure that you will look for an explanation of this phrase in your modern study Bible. And though some of them are pretty good when they're defending the Bible in technical matters and in solving technical problems, they always disappoint on the spiritual problems. What is the land of the living? Oh, the stud, average study Bible will say, it means that David is sure that through prayer he will be returned to safety in ordinary, everyday life. He'll be back in this land, the land of the living, at liberty, walking about, unafraid, and so on. The land of the living is here, they say, because the study Bibles on the whole are good at technical matters, but in spiritual interpretation, they will usually come out with the most outrageously mundane and prosaic things. They seem scared of seeing any uh, likelihood of this being a spiritual expression, that the land of the living is heaven. Well, friends, there's a very famous little piece of prose by a man called Sir Richard Baker, who was in the 1500s, a long time ago. He was a politician and a writer and also a spiritual writer. 
and he wrote a commentary on Psalms which, on the whole, is exceedingly boring. But he's a man of letters, and it comes out with some sizzlers, wonderful pieces of prose, and I've got something here I'm going to read to you. This is magnificent. Here are all the arguments for the land of the living being an allusion to heaven, just in a few sentences. And this comes, this was written in 1597. Alas, what a land of the living is this, in which there are more dead than living. And I think he means spiritually dead than living. He goes on to deal with the physical. More under the ground than above it, where the earth is fuller of graves than houses, where all life trembles under the threat of death, where death has power to tyrannize life. No, my soul, there only is the land of the living where there are none but the living, where there is a church not militant but triumphant, a church with no graveyard where death is swallowed up in victory. And I think that's perfect. Just in a few lines, there's no other argument to make. The land of the living is, of course, David referring to eternity. This is his parallel life. This is his other life. And he puts it in this marvellous way. Verse 5, O Lord, I said, I said, even that little word is important, I made a declaration, it was my declaration of faith, even as I put all my impossible situation before the Lord. I remembered that the Lord so works as to feed and nourish my spiritual life, my parallel life, most of all. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. That's my reward. Somebody seizes something of mine. I think to myself, I am living a parallel, another life, where God is overruling everything to my eternal good and security, and I serve him against that great day to please him and to bring in his people into the everlasting kingdom. And that's the sentiment of David in verse 5. So now he returns to the great prayer in verse 6. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Now he's going to affirm before God his utter dependence upon him. I am brought very low in strength, in opportunity to escape the threats against me. Even in spirit, I am brought low. I am worn out, O Lord. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. They have the upper hand. I can see no way out. And we have equivalent situations. Even when we're witnessing, even when we're evangelizing or preaching, you try to reach a person and you pray for the person. And then you get the opportunity to interact. And questions are asked and you try to answer them. But you soon discover the person has been utterly brainwashed. The person can no longer think. All the brainwashing of this world and perhaps of atheism and unbelief has made such inroads in the mind. And you struggle to get past the blockage, and materialism has such a powerful hold. Underneath, to a small extent, the person respects you, but then there's a great deal of disdain for you at the same time. And how are you going to get past it? And anyway, you know the person, and you know that there's great love of sin in the life, and how is that person ever going to surrender attachment to those sins? And you could despair. But you've got to show your dependence upon the Lord and articulate these things to him. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low, struggling with this person and that person. Deliver me, for they are stronger than I. 
and they have the upper hand or think they have and I can't bend them. Yes, but if you go to the Lord in a spirit of dependence upon him and call upon him, perhaps he will. Perhaps he, you can prevail with him more easily than with the person to whom you witness and he will soften the heart. And David proceeds to pray. And the last verse of this uh, psalm is very important to us. It's all about promises and vows. So we've been looking at articulating the need, affirming to build up our faith that the Lord knows how he's going to solve the problem. He's waiting for us to ask. We've looked at uh, the dangers and the desertions and the great consolation of remembering that we have a parallel or another life. Then we've affirmed our dependence upon God and then lastly here, we've got some promises and vows to make for the prayer finally to be complete or valid. Verse 7, bring my soul out of prison. Of course that's figurative, he wasn't in prison. If it's Engidai or Adullam, he was in a cave, a huge cave. But he couldn't, there was no escape. If he emerged, they'd be spotted and cut down by a vastly superior force. Bring my soul out of captivity. Yes, but we're often in some form of captivity. That I may praise thy name. Oh, look. David isn't saying, if only this prayer would be answered and I would be set free, well, then I'd be happy. Well, then I'd be so free. And then I'd be able to get back down to the things I love doing and be unworried and I'd be able to sleep at night and it would all be so much better. That doesn't seem to be in his mind. What's in his mind principally is bring my soul out of prison that I may praise thy name. And in the word praise he means not only praise God and thank him but speak of him and pay tribute to him and witness to him and tell others. And when you look at a verse like this, well, has this effect upon me and I'm sure it has it upon you? Don't you feel a spasm of conscience? Because I've had many deliverances, I know. And I haven't told anybody. And maybe I've forgotten to thank God any more than once and then all the business of life has taken over and it hasn't lingered long in my memory but I haven't encouraged anybody else or mentioned it to anybody else but when David prays he begs and he binds himself he asks and he makes a promise his motive for the prayer being answered is not his own comfort, I'm sure it is, but he puts first, bring my soul out of prison that I may praise thy name. Not only in prayer and praises, but also in witness and the encouragement of others. And then this curious phrase, which you can only understand in the light of praising God's name. The righteous shall compass me about. What does that mean? Well, obviously, it may have a literal meaning. If he's free from his kind of figurative imprisonment while pursued by Saul, well, then he literally will be back among the righteous. And the people he associates with who pray with him and sing with him and... Uh, who he fellowships with, well, he'll be back in their fellowship. So it does have an obvious literal fulfillment, but then it has other fulfillments. The righteous will be encouraged by him. He'll make a contribution to them. They'll be so immensely encouraged at the way in which God delivered David, their future king, and the one who they support, and they'll join him 
in praise and thanksgiving. But the, the first thing that David mentions here, the great fruit of his deliverance, is that he'll be able to praise God and speak of him and encourage the righteous. Or if only it was the same with us. If we could find a link to that. Hear my prayer, O Lord, because I fear if I'm delivered from this problem and I can see no way out, this will be a great... I will make sure that my testimony is a great encouragement to others. I will make sure that the outcome is to thy glory. If we could only put that before our own happiness and comfort legitimate as that is, the righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. So it's David's prayer in desperate circumstances, and it teaches us always to articulate our needs and not to get angry or self-pitying, but to go directly to God, to quieten our spirit's sense of unreasonableness and unfairness, and to go to the Lord. And we all need to remember that, to affirm that the Lord knows exactly how he's going to deal with things in answer to prayer, to rehearse the dangers and the problems, to remember that God's way of working will be first and foremost in the interests of our spiritual life not necessarily our earthly circumstances and to affirm our dependence upon him and make those promises so it's a very um, distinctive psalm of David it follows a particular theme the child of God in desperate circumstances and less desperate circumstances, but it's an instruction, an encouragement to us all.